KCR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho v. Lori Vallow Daybell. This is the time scheduled for a hearing on a motion filed by the defense entitled the Motion to Clarify Victim and Notice of Hearing. We are live streaming this on the court's official YouTube channel for public access due to the shortened nature of time to prepare for this hearing and representing the state. Uh, Rob Wood and Lindsay Blake. Mr. Archibald represents the defendant who is present here and Mr. Thomas as well. We are, as I mentioned, live streaming this and also keeping a record through the court reporter that's present. Courts received and reviewed the motion. Uh, let me just inquire first of counsel. Mr. Archibald, are you ready to proceed and offer argument in support of the motion? Yes, Your Honor. All right, and who will be arguing on behalf of the state? Is that you, Ms. Blake? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Blake, are you ready to proceed as well? Yes. Okay, the court would note that the sentencing is scheduled for Monday in this case, and ahead of sentencing, the courts received requests through certain uh, people to offer victim impact statements as permitted by Idaho uh, code section 19506, the victim's rights statute, as well as the Idaho Constitution, Article 1, Section 22. There's been a request to have a hearing to discuss whether or not uh, some particular people would qualify under those provisions. And so, Mr. Archibald, I've reviewed your motion. If you'd like to argue in support of the motion at this time, you can do so. Thank you, Your Honor. As the motion indicates, uh, a person by the name of Vicki Hoban, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but she has uh, petitioned the court to be considered a victim as she is Tammy Daybell's aunt. Uh, I think the court initially denied that, not knowing who she was, and then reconsidered and granted it. I think the court granted it uh, partly because we didn't know um, who on behalf of Tammy Daybell would speak. Now that the uh, pre-sentence report has been received, we find that Tammy Daybell's sister, Samantha Gwilliam, has submitted a statement, and uh, Tammy Daybell's father, Ron Douglas, has submitted a statement. In in Ron Douglas's statement, he specifically says that he's writing on behalf of myself and my now deceased wife. So Tammy Daybell's uh, mother passed away after Tammy did. And so Vicki Hoban wants to take the place of uh, Tammy's mother by, uh, by claiming to be a victim and wanting to be heard by the court as a victim. I don't think the law allows that. I think the law uh, specifically excludes uh, Ant. And uh, so if, if Tammy Daybell had no one speaking on her family's behalf, that I think the court's current order would be appropriate. But now that Tammy Daybell's sister and father have now spoken and <clears throat> Tammy Daybell's father specifically stating, I'm writing on behalf of myself and my now deceased wife. I think that there's a no provision for the court to consider an aunt as a victim able to speak on behalf of the Tammy Daybell family. So I, I know she's interested in the case. I don't know her personally. Uh, I don't have anything against her. I'm merely uh, asserting the, the law and the law uh, I believe does not allow this. So I'd ask the court to uh, reconsider or amend its order uh, prohibiting the, the victim impact statement from Vicki Hoban. I see that after I filed this motion, we actually received her statement so it is now uh, submitted to the court and would need to be stricken. I don't have anything else. All right, thank you, Mr. Archibald. Ms. Blake, what's the response from the state on the motion? 
Thank you, Your Honor. The state does recognize uh, that anytime we're dealing with victims' rights, oftentimes there are some unique issues that come up because we have a statute, we have the constitution, but they're ever evolving and being interpreted by the higher courts. We also recognize this court has turned to a Idaho court decision to assist in making a determination as to who should be considered victims with regard to a homicide. I think uh, some of this has been a matter of first impression for the court. There are several victims that had wanted to make a victim impact statement. And I think the court went through an analysis in determining who would be able to and who wouldn't be able to. So the state recognizes that there are some uh, individuals that would consider themselves victims that have not been allowed to make a statement. I think there are a lot of interested parties in this case, a lot of individuals that have suffered some form of harm uh, in whatever form that may be from the acts that occurred in this case. With regard to this particular motion, I think the state is really without a legal basis to make any kind of an objection or argument one way or the other. Uh, so on this issue, we will simply leave it to the court's discretion while we recognize that this is a somewhat uh, a matter of uh, first impression to at least some degree. Uh, we'll leave it to the court's discretion for that determination. All right, so to clarify, Ms. Blake, um... You're not stipulating to me granting the motion, is that correct? You're just arguing that you don't believe you have grounds to object to it, or I guess I do want to further kind of pin you down on your on the state's position here, whether it's a stipulation that the motion should be granted or just simply leaving to the court's discretion, let me sort it out. Yes, Your Honor, the state would not be stipulating. I think we're in that unique situation where the state does not technically represent the victims in the case any more so than um, as part of the general public for our representation. So we're always in a little bit of a precarious situation when it does come to victims' rights and what positions the state can take, what arguments we can make. But as far as the motion brought by Mr. Archibald, I don't think there's a legal basis for the state to make any kind of an objection. So we're not stipulating to it. We're simply leaving it in the court's discretion. All right. I appreciate your argument then. Mr. Archibald, uh, would you like to offer any rebuttal argument? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, I've been researching the issue obviously for some time in this case since it came up the court as it notes is constrained in some ways through the Idaho case law as well as the article 1 section 22 of the Idaho constitution and the victims rights statute under Idaho code 5306 and in this case the court received a request initially uh, i believe coming through not necessarily from the state, but through the prosecutor's office of a individual indicating they wish to make an impact statement, uh, Vicki Hoban, and the court went through an analysis and entered an order allowing for her to give a statement. The court initially uh, was under the impression that there were not going to be any statements made on behalf of the deceased victim in this case, Tammy Tamara Daybell. And at this point, there are uh, apparently family members that qualify, including her sister, Samantha Williams, and her father, Ron Douglas, who will make statements. So then the question becomes whether or not uh, that changes the rationale or whether the court would permit or allow Vicki Hoban to make an impact statement. Um, as an initial point, I would indicate that uh, by making these rulings and determinations, the court has never tried to minimize or not understand how far reaching the impact can be in a murder case for family members, uh, friends, associates, others that knew victims of this particular crime. Uh, Idaho does, however, have limitations on who's permitted the rights under the victim rights statute in the Constitution because they essentially get um, some privileges that wouldn't otherwise 
be afforded to normal uh, people without those privileges, such as being able to make a statement without being required to be placed under oath or cross-examined on the statement. The court would note there's a policy uh, behind allowing victims to be heard. Uh, one case that the court considered is a case called State versus Leon, 142 Idaho 705. And the issue is a little bit different there, talking about whether or not a DVD or video presentation was permissible as part of a victim impact statement. And really the focus in that case was on what it means to be heard. Um, under Idaho Code 19-5306E, the court, uh, well, the victim statute does indicate the, the term heard, that a victim has a right to be heard. So I'll note that this is just by analogy, but um, some of the language in that talks about, um, in that case, the discretion, the victim's right to be heard conforms with the discretion traditionally afforded a trial court to consider a wide range of information at sentencing, it says it's fundamental that a sentencing court may properly conduct an inquiry broad in scope, largely unlimited, either as to the kind of information it may consider or the source from which it may come. And that cites a case, Payne versus Tennessee, and also Matson 123, Idaho 625. This is the state Leon case. Further goes on to state, the sentencing judge is presumably able to ascertain the relevancy and reliability of the broad range of information and material which may be presented to it during the sentencing process and to disregard the irrelevant and unreliable. And the information conveyed by a victim exercising his or her right to be heard serves this purpose by relating the victim's personal characteristics and the impact of the murder on the victim's family. And that cites again to the state versus pain case. And then finally, victim impact information gives the court knowledge that is helpful for determining the proper punishment and prevents relegation of the victim to the status of a quote, baseless stranger. So there's certainly a policy that applies towards letting uh, those that would be designated as victims to make impact statements. The technical issue here is who qualifies and who is allowed to be a victim pursuant to the statute in this case. Under Idaho Code 19-5306E3, that indicates that the court may designate a representative from the immediate family to exercise these rights on behalf of a deceased, incapacitated, or minor victim. In this case, the court has already made a ruling that Vicki Hovan is not technically a victim. What she would be pursuant to the court's order was a designated representative under Idaho Code 19-5306E and the designated representative of Tammy Daybell's now deceased mother. When I look at the language of the statute in the case law, what I don't find is any limiting language stating that this designation of a representative can only apply if there's an absence of anyone else to make a statement. There's nothing in the statute that indicates that a designated representative has to only be appointed under certain circumstances, such as the unavailability of anyone else to make a statement. And what it does indicate is that there can only be one designated representative for an immediate family because it is in the singular that the court may designate a representative from the immediate family. But uh, there's no mutually exclusive language in any case law I've seen stating that once there is an immediate family member, then designation of a representative is not permitted. And so when I consider the broad ranging policies of allowing victims to make statements here. And I'll note that some of the Idaho case law is more stringent, I think in a capital case where the jurors make the ultimate determination. Uh, I do believe the case law supports that a trial court judge has some broader discretion in considering relevant and pertinent information for sentencing. 
such as was stated in that state versus Leon case. So without finding any case law or statutory language that makes the appointment of a designated representative mutually exclusive, uh, and I do think this is probably a case of first impression in Idaho, I am going to deny the motion and allow that Vicki Hoban's statement may be considered as a victim impact statement, not that she's the victim, but she is the designated appointed representative of Tammy Daybell's mother, who is now deceased. And so uh, in the absence of any other authority that's been cited to the court or any statutory language, I don't believe it's error to permit that statement to be made. Uh, I will, however, leave it up to the discretion, of course, of the prosecution as to whether or not uh, you think she should make any further comment or statement at the sentencing hearing or whether the court would consider the addendum to the PSI, which was submitted as a written statement, which I do consider uh, to be permissible given this analysis. So the ruling is I am going to deny the motion and will permit her as a designated representative to provide a statement in support of sentencing. Uh, that'll be the ruling then on the motion. Uh, unless there's any questions from counsel, I think that will conclude the matters we needed to argue this morning. Uh, Mr. Archibald, anything further from the defense then this morning? No. All right. Does the state have anything further to bring up, Ms. Blake? Uh, Your Honor, maybe just for clarification, the court had indicated something uh, would be up to the state with regard to additional statements. Yeah, in other words, I don't know if she's going to make an in-person statement during sentencing or not. And, and that's just up to the state to advise her based on my ruling as to whether or not I don't even know if she intends to do that. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. And I don't know, we can get an answer for the court of what her intention is. All right, counsel, uh, one last thing while we're on the line then here, we do have sentencing scheduled for Monday. I'm anticipating and have planned that we'll get that done in a day. Is it looking from your estimation of what's gonna occur like uh, you think we'll be able to conclude that in a one day hearing? Let me start with uh, maybe you, Mr. Wood. Uh, yes, your honor, I believe we'll be able to be one day. All right. Uh, Mr. Archibald or Mr. Thomas, do you think we're able to get sentencing concluded in a day? Yes. Okay. Well, I appreciate your input on that. Uh, we don't need to necessarily stop at the end of normal business hours if it's going to take longer. I just think it uh, becomes a lot more planning necessary and interferes with other calendared issues if we go further. So uh, we will plan on starting on time and I'll see counsel then in court this Monday for sentencing. We'll be in recess.